Hi, and welcome to Psychic Today. I'm your host, Jill Roberts. And today's topic is going to be on the grieving process. I know I've done a couple of episodes last year about grieving and mediumship or just mediumship in general, but today I want to just talk about grieving and healing. There is no set way for anyone to grieve, and that you have to remember. You have to be kind and gentle with yourself, whether that means you're stoic or hysterical or laughing. You know, everybody grieves differently, and we go through waves of intense grief when we've lost a loved one, whether it's something that's been a long time coming, like an illness where you think you're prepared for it compared to a tragic death where somebody is in an accident or has an illness come on rapidly, like a heart attack. Um, It really doesn't make a difference because no, no one is prepared, you know, no matter how long you have. And I hear people say that to each other in the sense of, You know, well, at least you had time. You knew your loved one was passing away or had cancer or whatever the case may be. And my loved one just, boom, was was here one day and gone the next. It's still a trauma. And when we have traumas like this, losing a loved one changes the course of your life forever. No matter what people say. Yes, it will get easier, and I can tell you from experience and from what I do for a living and as a grief counselor as well that it will get better, but your life is different. Your life has changed. There's something missing, that person, that loved one. You know, you, you some people, and that includes myself, do the before this person died and after this person died. You kind of divide up your life into those categories. And no matter how long the person is gone, you will still divide your life up into those categories. And whether you do it or not, if you do it, it's okay. The point I'm trying to make is this. Everybody handles grief differently. So whether it's yourself or somebody in your family or a neighbor or a friend who is going through something, give them a break. Don't judge them. Don't say they're, they don't look sad enough or they're not acting appropriately. Of course they're not acting appropriately. Of course they're acting strange. Their life has been upended and the rug has been pulled out of them. And their life has changed on a dime. So there are things, of course, we can do to help with the grieving process. What I'm trying to say today is, whether it's yourself or somebody you know, you have to be kind to yourself. You have to let yourself feel the way that you feel and know that it's okay to feel that way, whatever the feelings are. Um, Suicidal ideation can come and go. If you are having uh, thoughts like that, Please get in touch with a medical professional or somebody. Talk to somebody, whether it's a family member or a counselor or a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist or whatever, whoever, your pastor, your rabbi, your whomever. Um, It's important because you're not thinking clearly. You know, the first year is the toughest because you not only are muddling through life as a different type of person and having this different experience, but you're also having all of the firsts. The first birthday that person has gone has been gone for. Your first birthday the person has gone for. The first anniversary of their passing. The first holiday season the first Thanksgiving, if you're here in the United States. Um, There's just so many firsts. 
And there's little first too. The first time you smile since they're passing and then you feel guilty. I've gone through it. I know it. I've lived it. You have to let it pierce you. You can't try and keep it at bay. You can't try and keep up appearances for other people's sake. You have to do what you have to do to heal. Like on an airplane and they're going over um, the directions of in case there is some sort of accident, you have to put the, you know, mask on your face first and then help your child or your loved one or your, the person sitting next to you. You have to do it for yourself, even if that means your children see you cry, even if that means your parents see you cry, even if that means your friends and your neighbors see you cry. If you feel like you need to cry, you have to cry. You cannot put it off. I put it off like an idiot. And then I couldn't cry. And it just was something that was bubbling up to the surface. And I knew it was going to come out somehow. And it did eventually. And I had a very young one at home at this time. And I it was almost like I had to schedule in crying. Because I did not want my son to see me upset and crying. Because I knew he wouldn't understand. He wouldn't understand why I'm upset. And he wouldn't understand why my loved one is not here anymore. It's a difficult process and everybody, again, handles it differently. And you have to give yourself or that person a break without judgment. That's the most important thing. You know, I watch so many things and I speak to so many people and to so many clients who say, you know, I'm worried about my loved one. They're not taking this death properly. They are not crying or they're just staring off into space or they're just too serious. Well, they're in shock. They're in a trauma and they're dealing with it the only way they know how. And I'm saying this to you because everybody experiences this in their life. They lose somebody that they love and it is not a pleasant, it is a life-changing experience. You can go through it and come out the other side. You can go through it and come out the other side spiritually more evolved even. But it all depends on how you handle it. So for the first year, I want you to be very, very gentle with yourself. And just know that whatever it is that you're doing, it's okay. You know? If you're crying 24 hours a day, if you're not sleeping, if you're sleeping too much, if you can't concentrate, if you, you don't need antidepressants unless, you know, you think you're going to try and commit suicide. But you, if you're having highs and lows, that's normal. And sometimes we need to hear this. We need to hear that this is normal, you know. However you deal with it is normal for you. So, you know, don't think that because you're having mood swings or because one day you're, you're up and the next day you're down, that's going to be like that. And it's going to be like that for a while. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I'm just telling you the reality of the first year is the toughest. Because you go through all those firsts. You know, the first time I didn't think about that person as soon as I I opened my eyes in the morning. That's a first. The first time I fell asleep without dreaming about that person or thinking about that person right before I went to sleep. That's a first. First time I went out by myself shopping or doing, you know, um, errands and I wasn't looking around and thinking about that person. That's a first. And when you get to those types of firsts, those are good firsts because those are signs of healing. Not forgetting, but healing. And then, like I said, you're going to have the first of the anniversary, the birthdays, the holidays, everything else. And that 
is where it's going to bring it all back up again. You know, initially, it's a shock. You're traumatized. You're dealing with arrangements. And everybody is around and everybody is concerned. You're kind of just like a zombie walking around and not knowing what is going on because you're just in shock. And then those people leave because the funeral or whatever the ritual is over and you're by yourself. And that's when it starts. And that's when you have these waves of either it's survivor skills or it's, you know, the guilt of feeling that you could have done something more. You couldn't have done anything more. Know that now. Whatever the situation is, you couldn't have done anything more. There's always that could have, should have, would have. And don't do it to yourself. It is torture. And you're torturing and you're being tortured as it is. If, you know, people also don't know how to act around somebody who's experienced a loss. It sometimes... People get, without consciously knowing it, superstitious in a way that, oh my God, especially if it's a loss of a child, which is the worst type of loss that there is. Um, It's like it's catching, like a disease. If I I spend too much time with this person, it might happen to me because it makes that person look at the situation and not pretending like it doesn't exist. People don't lose children or people don't lose whomever. They don't lose, you know, their dogs to cancer at such a young age or, you know, the family pet or their mother or their father or their brother, sister, mother, husband, whatever. It makes them look at it. And a lot of people don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to think about children passing away. I love my kids more than anything in the world, and there's nothing that I wouldn't do for them. So, of course, it's hard to be around clients who have lost children. But I am, they are my first priority when it comes to my business is my clients. Of course, my children are always my first priority. When it comes to my business, my clients are, and I would never turn away a client because I don't, I'm uncomfortable, and I don't, want to think about something like that happening. It's during those times that you really need to be there for that person, whether it's a friend or a family member. It's uncomfortable, and people don't know what to say. You know, if you need me, I'm here. If you ever want to talk about it, of course you're not going to want to talk about it right now. Or sometimes people want to talk about it all the time, depending on the person. So, whether it's yourself or you're the person who is trying to be there for somebody else who is going through something, you have to be kind to the person going through the loss and, of course, yourself. There are certain boundaries. You want to be there for that person, you be there for that person, but you be there for that person in an empathetic way. Try and put yourself in their shoes, as tough as it is. And try and see what it is that you can do to help their day go a little bit easier. Because without that, we lose our humanity. And that is the time when we need our humanity the most. So stay tuned. I'll be right back. Hi. This is Jill Roberts. I'm the host of Psychic Today. And what I want to talk to you today is about Anchor. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? When I was trying to get this podcast off the ground, I had so many questions, such as how do I even record an episode? How do I get my show into the apps that people like to listen to them on? How do I make money from my podcast? The answer to every one of these questions is really simple. It's Anchor. 
Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. And best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now Anchor can match you with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's what I'm doing right now by reading this ad. I really couldn't have done it without Anchor. And I've tried other platforms, and by far Anchor is the best. So if you always wanted to start a podcast, make money doing it, go to anchor.fm slash start. That's anchor, A-N-C-H-O-R dot F-M forward slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters already using Anchor. That's anchor.fm slash start. I can't wait to hear your podcast. And welcome back to Psychic Today. I'm your host, Jill Roberts, and today we're talking about the grieving process. Now, there are, of course, some things that can help with grieving and healing, and there's so many do's and don'ts out there. You have to do what's right for you. So there are certain mediums who will not deal with somebody who has lost someone within the first four months. And that's up to the discretion of the particular medium. I actually do a grieving and mediumship package where it's several um, sessions one-on-one. And of course, yes, we do use medium. I use mediumship with the client, but I also do grief counseling. I give support. And I give my client whatever they need. And it's somebody that is a stranger to them. It's not a neighbor or a friend or a sibling or a family member. So they can be completely honest about how they're feeling. And we go through all that, all those things and all those steps. And I see where my client is and at what stage they are in the healing process. I see clients as soon as they need me. So that could be, you know, a week after. That could be a month, a year, whatever. It doesn't make a difference. For me, it depends on the person. It depends on the case. And I will see clients before four months. Um, But that's me. uh, Mediumship can help because you're getting the first couple of weeks after a loved one dies is when they're present very strongly around you. And during that time, we are in um, kind of like a fog. So a lot of the times we don't get the message or see the gifts that they have left us. So it's sometimes beneficial to be in touch with a medium because they can um, not only give you messages, and I am what's called an evidential medium, so I do channeling sessions before my, I have the appointment with my clients where I get in touch with that person, and I don't like to know who the person is ahead of time unless it's something that the client needs to talk about first, which is fine. But um, if I am doing just evidential mediumship on on a client where it's a one-off session as opposed to a grieving and mediumship package, um, I will channel a couple times up to the time of the appointment. So that way I can give the information of who the person is, what they did for a living, how they passed, you know, what some significant dates, what they look like, as much info, evidential inf- information I can give. And <clears throat> that way they know that there's no way, they don't have any doubts in their mind that their loved one is not there with them. 
but um, in a grieving and mediumship package where I'm not only a medium, but I am a grief counselor, I am a support system, and I am someone who is helping to heal my client. Mediumship will is a part of it, and it will help knowing that your loved one is okay. It will help knowing certain facts of what happened or how it happened or why it happened. Um, if there are things left unknown, you know, I have also studied forensic mediumship. So, you know, that goes into missing people in certain cases like that. Um, not all mediums do that. And if they do and they haven't been properly trained, you know, they're prone to misinterpret some information, perhaps. I always make sure I'm trained in everything that I practice with my clients. I'm certified in every single thing that I do. I became a grievance counselor for my clients because I know they just don't need a medium. In this day and age of immediacy and needing everything now, 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 you're going to look for a fortune teller than perhaps but if you want to dig deep and actually get through something horrible and it just feel a little bit better because it's not going to feel great no matter what you do, um, going to somebody that you find on Yelp or who is in your neighborhood or whatever is not going to be, it's, it's not a quick fix. Um, if you do decide to do the mediumship route and you need somebody who is going to um, address all issues and all areas of the trauma, all areas in which you need healing and help and abundance in your life. Um, and that doesn't mean I am the one for you. I'm just saying in general, you just don't want to go to any medium. Because they're, you know, you want somebody who's going to be channeling. You want somebody who's going to be working with you. You know, you want someone who is going to take a phone call in the middle of the night in an emergency. You know, those are the things that are important. That's the type of support system I'm talking about. Not just someone who knows the different stages of grief. We all know that. And not just someone who's been through losing, having the same type of loss or has had loss. I mean, by the time you're an adult, you've lost somebody that you've loved, whether it be a grandparent or, you know, a fiance <laughs> or a partner. It could be anybody. And it happens. And like they say, unfortunately, it is a part of life. It's a part of growth. It's a part of rebirth of yourself because you're going to become a different person. And that can't be helped. That's something that happens. You need to let it, like I said, pierce you because it's very dark night of the soul. And if you deal with it at the time, then it's not going to be something that lingers certain things like, you know, survivor's guilt or, um, you know, certain situations like that. If you deal with the situation at the time in the right way, whether it be working with certain stones that deal with dark night of the soul and having to deal with a loss like that and a trauma, then, you know, there are certain methods and things that we can do to not have you have something that's going to come up 10 years down the road that's still unresolved. You need it resolved at the time that you're doing it, even if you feel like you're the walking dead because you're zombified and you're in shock 
and you don't you need somebody to kind of just point you in the right direction because you don't know whether you're coming or going and that's natural that's something that everybody goes through and again everybody grieves differently so you have to remember that as well people may act in a different way than you would. And that's okay. Some people may need the help and the support. They may want to be in touch with their loved one. And in the first couple weeks, they are very strongly around. And then, you know, and they've already crossed over. It's not like they're, you know, walking around you and they're, they're stuck here. Um, but the longer someone's passed, the stronger connection they, they can make with you. Um, or if they were clear, if they had their developed their clear sentence, uh, clear senses in life, they can be a very strong connector in death. So you have those situations as well. Um, but a general rule is I find that when it's within the first month or so, you know, look around. If there are things out of place, you're not losing your mind. The things are out of place because you're getting left gifts. They're just letting you know, hey, I love you. I'm here. I'm okay. And who doesn't want to know that from their loved one? You know? Jack says hi. Jack knows that you're doing X, Y, and Z. And Jack says, you know, don't do this. Be kind to yourself. Don't feel guilty. And they don't want you to feel bad. This is the odd thing. It's like they cross over. They don't want you to feel bad. But how can you not help but feel bad? Because you want them physically here. So it's kind of weird because they kind of don't get that fact. You know, even though they've experienced losses in their life when they were in the physical form and they, um, they cross over and they're like, Hey, don't cry. I'm okay. And they forget that what it's like to be in physical form already. And a lot of times, you know, I have to tell them your loved one is upset because you're not there physically, or they can't see you, or they're missing your gifts, or, you know, that butterfly that came in the wintertime in Russia when you were on vacation is where it doesn't exist in it naturally was you, and they just dismiss it with their logical mind. You know, you <laughs> sometimes we need to be hit over the head with things to realize that, you know what, maybe this isn't so logical. Maybe this is a sign. Maybe this is my loved one. And that's what I'm here to tell you. Because it is your loved one. Don't dismiss it. I have a whole blog post on it. After my grandmother passed. And I've spoken about this before. And we were in a uh, mass was being said for her. We were there. And there were these three beautiful white pigeons or doves. that had gotten into the church somehow. And I knew it was her, my grandfather, and my Uncle Desi. That they were all together. We were just missing a fourth from my Aunt Helen, but I'm sure she was there somewhere too. <laughs> um, and it was just beautiful to see. And these birds were flying back and forth, and they, they came in right around. And the, I'm in Manhattan on the Upper East Side, where the church is kind of sandwiched in between two, two high rises. So there's really no possible way for these birds to be flying in through a window or anything like that because there's, there's, there's no way, you know, to get in. So I knew as soon as they said my grandmother's name and all of a sudden these birds appeared out of nowhere, I knew that it was, it was a sign from her. And plus, she leaves me little bobby pins all over the place because she used to sleep with them in her hair. 
and I actually got one today. <laughs> and, I, and she was a very, very strong communicator um, psychically when she was here. It's obviously who I get it from. And she's a very strong communicator now. And those things, let me tell you, those things helped me through her passing. She was 94 years old. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I didn't care whether she was 94 or she was, you know, 24. It was, it was still a shock. It was still, it was still very painful. It's only been not even a, a year and a half. And I miss her every single day. My, my children miss her every single day. And it's a loss that, you know, I feel on a regular basis because it's someone who was in my life on a daily basis. She was so full of life and energy and she was so funny and she was always happy, never depressed. She was a joy to talk to, whether it was on the phone or in person. You know, there were times that she even came and lived with me for months at a time. Um, when I needed her. So, and she was 80 when my son was born and 86 when my daughter was born. So she was, a, you know, a spring chan, but she still babysat them. She had so much energy. And the way she passed was really kind of swift. And thankfully for, for her, she didn't die of a long drawn out disease, but it still hurts. And it's always going to hurt. But the on-the-go channeling that I get when I'm, you know, when I shouldn't be getting messages from her because my mind is distracted and I'm doing something else, she comes through and I'll hear Claire audibly, oh, remember this or remember that. And it'll be something that there's just no way I would even think about. And I hear it in her voice. Or I look down and there's a bobby pin in the middle of the sidewalk. Or, you know, I get all of these messages from her. She's very clear, very strongly communicative, clairvoyant, uh, clairaudiently, which is clear hearing. And I hear all the time. She argues with me in my mind. <laughs> I want to do something. And she's like, no, don't do that because of X, Y, and Z. And sometimes I just say, okay, nanny, please. You know what? I hear you. And I understand you, and, and I love it because I can just hear her wherever I am. And it really helped me so much with the grieving process because I was afraid of her passing from when I was three years old because I was so close to her. She was almost like a mother to me. And for her to have survived not only my coming of age and becoming an adult, but getting to see my children and not just that, but getting to know my children and having a relationship with my children. Even my, my youngest who is nine. I mean, she has such wonderful memories with her. Uh, it's, she cried for a year straight every night. She would say, mommy, please, can you channel nanny? And sometimes I would, you know, question, is this the right thing that I'm doing for my child? Because I don't want her to be in pain, but she can't do it herself. So I would, you know, give her a couple of messages or, you know, I would tell her something that happened in her day that there's no way I would know would happen. And that would just make her happy. And if it made my daughter happy and it helped with the healing process for, and she's young, then it was wonderful for her. You know, when you generally I don't see clients under the age of 18 um, unless it's a special circumstance, unless I have permission from the parents, unless the family knows, um, because they're still forming and, and it's it's not something that unless it's an emergency type of situation like with my daughter, I won't do. But for adults, I can't tell you how much it helped me 
get through the death of my grandmother because I knew that she was okay. I knew she was still here with me. She was giving me gifts and there was nothing else I could ask for. And then there were other family members like my mother who, you know, was just completely gutted from the situation because she didn't have what I had. And I said to her, I wish I could just teach you how to do it. Because if, if you take out the time, if you really want to know how to do it, I'm not a special person. I studied this for many years and became, became certified in several different areas of mediumship and channeling and shamanic stuff and, you know, and becoming a light worker in many different ways. This is my life's path. And that's fine if it's not for you. But if you want to learn how to do this for yourself and to do it for others, you know, I'm more than willing. I have actually um, a subscription to learn how to channel, enhance your intuition, your psychic senses. Um, there is a mediumship course that I do do, um, and it takes about 12 months. And um, it's one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not doing, you know, one of those web courses that you can just pay me and you get it, it's already done and you can do it at your own pace. We can do it at your own pace, but we do it one-on-one. -on -one. You cannot get a smaller class size than that because that's what you need. If you want to learn to do this and you want to do it for yourself just because, or if you want to do it for, your, for yourself because you want to do be a channel for somebody else who may be going through something, then you need one-on-one. -on -one. You need mentoring. You need to learn how to do it from somebody who has learned in many different ways and in many different philosophies and many different paths. Um, you don't want to be part of a classroom where it's a live thing and it's you're on with other people. You want to be able to ask the questions and not feel foolish. And there are no stupid questions when it comes to this type of work. But sometimes we're embarrassed to ask it or we feel silly asking it. Some people have no problem asking it, asking questions, but some of us do. And that's why I do one-on-one -on -one, because that way you get all the information, you get time with me, and we do it on a monthly basis. We do it once a month. During that month, you're going to have all the material that you need for self-study and to do at your own pace. And then you have me, where I'm going to be doing things with you, and I'm going to be testing you, and I'm going to be first teaching you. So whether it's channeling or crystal healing or mediumship, I do have these what are called, I guess, pre, uh, paid plans or subscriptions where you pay um, a little bit a month every month so that way it's not an exorbitant fee. It's something that you can handle. It's something that's less than a, cough, a, cup, a cup of coffee a day for the month. Um, I want to do that for my clients. I want to be able to pass this information along. No. Because, sorry, I need to pass this information along because it's, so important if this is something that you want to do. Because helping somebody in the grieving process is so rewarding. Or channeling your loved one when you need to hear them at that time and being able to do it yourself. I mean, I went through a death without, I mean, I, I used other mediums. I didn't use myself. And I went through a death with somebody who was a strong communicator and who I didn't need to use. I didn't want to use other mediums. Um, I mean, I didn't need to use other mediums before, but I just felt that I should use other mediums because, you know, my children were a lot younger. Well, I only had one at the time and he was very little. Um, but with the second passing, of my grandmother, I didn't need, 
I was able to do it myself and it cut down on the agony and that, that dread in the pit of your stomach and that pain in your heart because you can just get in touch with them anytime you want. Whether you're crying or you're yelling at them, you're angry, you know, wherever you are in the grieving process. The grieving process goes on forever because we're always going to miss our loved ones. And it's natural. So I just wanted to put that out there in case anybody is interested in actually learning how to channel or learning mediumship to do as a business to do for others. Channeling would be more for yourself and, you know, doing what I do when I connect with my loved ones in spirit. Um, there's two types of channeling. They're sitting down and making a routine and doing it. And there is channeling on the go, which is when your mind is somewhere else and the person comes in and starts just, you know, connecting with you and, whether you're busy or not, it's it happens. So I figured the channeling is for you. The channeling is for divination. The channeling is for um, intuition, empathy, um, developing your um, psychic senses, your clairvoyance, your clairaudience, your claircognizance, your clairgustance, your clairsentience, your clair everything. <laughs> if you have a physical sense for it, then you have a psychic sense for it as well. And we'll go through subjective and objective clairs. So, and I will explain that with you. There's just so many topics to go through. Um, for mediumship, it's a lot more in depth. There's a certification if you want. Um, you can do gallery style readings and you will be doing readings on people that you don't know um, for the certification. Um, you can do it also if you want for practice. Um, that is the mediumship. The channeling is something different. Channeling is, I think, wonderful for people who are grieving. And they do do grieving and healing, like I said. Whether uh, that's some, you're not interested in learning and it's something that you just need to do. You need to hear from your loved one. You need to be able to talk. I am a, you know, a, um, a uh, certified counselor in that aspect, uh, a grief counselor, and I will support you in any way you need. So I hope the bits of information I've given you have helped. If you're going through something, I am deeply sorry for your loss and know that however you are feeling is how you're supposed to be feeling and it's okay. Don't let anybody else tell you different. As always, be gentle with yourself and be gentle with those who are going through it as well. This is Jill Roberts at Psychic Today. You may contact me at info at psychicmediumnyc.com. That's info at psychicmediumnyc.com. My number is 917-300-8224. If you want to call or if you want to visit my website, it's psychicmediumnyc.com. So be kind and gentle with yourself, and I will talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.